Hey guys, welcome back to Young Americans Abroad, your best place for weekly content on young American soccer players playing overseas. My name's Austin Van Churn. And my name's Patrick Ferry. And as always, welcome to our show. Well, guys, we took a few weeks off after the long season, Pat, and, uh, you know, we're back again today. Getting That's ready right, to Austin. Summer. We have a lot of, uh, lot of summer, summer action coming through with some uh, exciting tournaments and uh, hopefully, you know, some transfers going on and uh, um, some uncertainty with the national team. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, today we want to talk about um, our takeaways from the U-20 World Cup and the U.S. team that did some good things but also did some bad things. Yeah, and uh, also heading over to the uh, the senior team as well, Austin. Uh, we'll talk about their uh, interesting uh, friendlies, you could say, uh, against Jamaica and Venezuela, as uh, as well as a brief uh, Gold Cup preview, as it is coming up uh, in, I believe, a week or so. Yeah, that's right. And then finally, we'll finish with uh, you know two Yaz who made moves at the end of the season or potentially upcoming this summer. So uh, you don't want to miss that. So the U20s recently finished their World Cup run uh, losing to Ecuador this past Saturday, 2-1 in the quarterfinals. And Pat, you know, in this competition, we saw some players who stood out, um, but we also found out some concerning things about a few players. So, um, you know, what what do you think overall of this tournament? And yeah, Austin, I think, uh, yeah, I think in general, um, it, it was exciting to see them, as we'll go into it, uh, get to where they did, um, you know, beat a good France team, unfortunately get knocked off at the same point where I think this is the third consecutive cycle where they've gotten to the quarters but yeah like you said um some good play, you know players stood out um and then some other players which we expected a little more from kind of the stocks went down but we'll get in more into that that's right and um you know so the first game that the u20s faced in their group which was uh you know against ukraine and pat you know in this game they came out they looked very good in possession um you know i remember when i was watching this game i was very impressed over the first, uh, you know, 10 to 20 minutes where we would just dominated possession. And, um, you know, we didn't really create too many great chances in the final third, but we just really controlled the game. Um, yeah, it looked like Ukraine but, was kind of content to, to sit back there for sure. Yeah, yeah, and we were, you know, very crisp in our passing and, um, you know, it was a bright start. But unfortunately, you know, Ukraine struck first with uh, that nice long ball over the back, uh, you know, over Serginio Dest's head and, um, you know, we're the first ones to uh, to score in that game. And, uh, you know, we did come back. We had a, a nice goal, I, I believe, in the late 30s, 30th minute um, where Brandon Cervania um, finished a really nice play where, um, you know, Paxton Pomacall, Serginio Dest and Tim Weah combined um, brilliantly in the box. And, you know, Tim Weah had that nice, um, like, on the ground uh, cross to Cervania, which was, you know, a great play by him. And, uh, you know, Cervania got us back level. But, uh, you know, in the second half, Ukraine came back with a, uh, a set piece and, uh, you know, went back in front and ended up putting the game away. And, you know, it was a tough start to the tournament, Pat. Yeah, definitely a, a tough – yeah, a little brutal, tough, tough start with uh, you know all the hype and when everyone was really excited about the game and uh, you know thought uh, Ukraine has some good players and they have uh, I think that keeper was a Real Madrid uh, youth product. I think he's on loan yeah. somewhere, but um, is, is a good great keeper and it's a pretty solid team. But yeah, like you said, um, just some mental mistakes and stuff. Like second goal, I think it was just mismarking there. Um, yeah, well, Sergio Desk got just out muscle. Yeah, yeah, that was for yeah, the first that was goal. Brutal. So that was brutal. It was just, yeah, it was basically two mistakes. You know, like I said before, we played very well in this game. Um, and we came out on fire, and it was great to see. And, um, you know, I felt comfortable, and, and I don't want to speak for you, Pat. Maybe you, you felt a little bit different after this game. But I felt, you know, we showed well in that game. We just weren't able to get the result. Um, you know, I was disappointed we played Brandon Cervania over a player like, um, well, I guess we started Paxton Pomacall in the, the midfield and Tim Way up top, or sorry, Paxton Pomacall on the wing and Tim Way up top. So I was disappointed we didn't see Sebastian Soto in that first game. Um, and Brandon Cervani I wasn't a big fan of at that point or didn't think he provided much um, quality in the midfield. Yeah, definitely. But as we sort of found out a little bit later, then 
maybe there was uh, with Brandon Savanio on the field, we were a little bit better, which, uh, you know, we'll get to in a second. But, you know, after that game, Pat, you know, we went on and played Nigeria where we really need to get a win or at least, a, you know, a draw um, from that yeah. game. So that one, that yeah. One, yeah, definitely awesome. Then. Exactly like you said, because a uh, crucial game in Nigeria was a you know, coming in very dangerous team. They always have you know, great talents at the youth levels, a lot of speed that could really, you know, beat you on the flanks there and uh, you know, get behind your back line. But we were able to pull out a, a 2 nothing win, which is really exciting. And uh, the two goals, which the player was actually left out um, in the first game, uh, came from Sebastian Soto with a brace. So uh, awesome. Sorry. I thought that was really exciting to see. Yeah, that game was, um, yeah, very, a lot of high energy, um, or it was just a high energy game in general. Um, very tense game as well, because like I said, we, we really need to come out and win that game if we wanted to, you know, comfortably make it out of the group. That's and you can right. tell that, you know, the boys, the boys were, um, you know, a little, a little rattled after that first game and kind of realized the magnitude of that second game where, um, you know, they've, they, they made a mistake in the first game. They let it slip away from them. And, um, you know, if they let the, the second game slip away, and it, they very well could have at times. You know, Nigeria looked very dangerous um, several moments in the game, you know, with some of those long shots they were trying. So, um, but, yeah, it was it was a good game and a good performance from us. Um, Absolutely. I think business. Absolutely so. awesome. And, uh, yeah, I want to touch on uh, Soto's uh, goals as well, too, because he had a nice, uh, nice header. I think it was a Mendez cross. Um, it was from a corner kick, and um, yeah, yep. he was kind of open there and, you know, drilled it right back, so that gave some confidence, and then the second goal, uh, Gloucester made a nice run and a beautiful assist. Oh, it was um, brilliant. That, yeah. that was brilliant, uh, and again, we can get into it further uh, down, but I thought Gloucester was fantastic uh, for most of the tournament, but um, again, another assist to Soto, who made, really, I thought he was making very, uh, really smart runs all uh, all game. Um, I think he made some really good runs peeling off of the defenders and things like that, and uh uh, kind of finished it um, off. So that was really exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, you know, um, there's two games in this tournament where he scored two goals. And I definitely think his best game was that Nigeria game. He, yeah. Um, he coming right into the side, he really provided us with something that Tim Weah didn't provide us with up top. And that was, you know, someone that could we could play the ball into and be comfortable kind of putting his back to goal and, and um, you know, holding the ball up you know, that hold up play that I right, right. So Because yeah, I think for that game they played, I think it was Durkin, Mendez and Pomacall um, back in the midfield. I right. Think that was the three. And then obviously Soto um, line of the wings, he was uh, the front and center there in the forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked, it worked out well. And um, so, you know, we got the three points in that game. We were back on track, um, but we weren't guaranteed, you know, safety or, uh, you know, guaranteed to get out of the group um, going into the last day. So, you know, here comes Qatar, a team that lost, I believe, what was it, four nothing to Nigeria, and then Something they lost like that. one nil to Ukraine. So you know, they kind of showed, uh, you know, at least against Ukraine, that they, um, you know, we're kind of here to play. Um, Ukraine did sit back in that game and and kind of played the same style they played against us, and that's a you know the type of style where you're not going to beat teams four nil, five nil. But, you know, looking at Ukraine or excuse me, looking at Qatar and the way they played in those first two games, you could kind of tell they weren't they weren't really pushovers. Um, you know, they were error prone at time, but they came out and played a very tough game against us. But I do think, you know, we were not set up very well um, in terms of just being comfortable with the team that Tab put out. And Pat, you know, the one um, <coughs> excuse me, the one big change that Tab made was putting Mark McKenzie at right back. Um, yeah. Over Nino Dest, who at this point in the tournament had his struggles. I think uh, they're a little over magnified. Um, you know, the first game he did have some bad moments, but I thought against Nigeria, he was, he was, he was all right. Yeah. But he has such an offensive or a threat going forward, I guess, as a, an outside back there. Yeah, and I, I just didn't understand why we played Mark McKenzie at right back. No, like, and I, uh, it didn't make sense to me in Austin. I know, like, uh, in the last game, too, uh, Richards had an injury, and McKenzie sub subbed on to him at halftime. But, yeah, right. I mean, just throwing Richards or um, McKenzie, excuse me, out on the right back, like you said, uh, uh, just he, he seemed slow to react and just didn't seem uh, comfortable there. Yeah, like, he did his best, but he's just not a right back. And we had, you know, Julian Araujo on the bench – who didn't play a minute at this tournament, which is my one or one of my 
things or takeaways from this tournament where I just, you know, was kind of disappointed. That uh, that was a head scratcher for me because I think Julian Araujo would have been, you know, a very capable player to come on the pitch. Like I would have, you know, been very comfortable with just throwing him on in, in any situation, even when we thought maybe Serginho Dest was, um, you know, getting too exposed. I was perfectly fine with putting Julian Araujo out there. I don't think we needed to try try a um, you know a center back at Absolutely. right back to kind of cover for us, our defensive you know ineptitude at times. But um, so yeah, you know that was disappointing. Um, yeah, the team in this game just didn't really look comfortable. Um, you know, Abubakar Kaita had a very big mistake um, in the earlier, I guess the late first half that almost led to a goal. And it was a great David Ochoa save that, um, that stopped the goal from happening. But, um, you know, this game was, was definitely a gritty game. Um, it was a game where, you know, we, we were not good on the day. Um, and like I said, I think a lot of it had to do with the way we were set up and just players playing out of position, not comfortable with their roles. And, you know, in this game, Alex Mendez and Chris Durkin both got yellow cards so we knew if we made it out of the group, we were kind of in trouble, or at least we thought we were in trouble. And, um, you know, Tim Weah was able to, to pull us out, Pat. He was yeah, able that to was nice. Out. Awesome. And I think it was the 76th minute um, off some, some nice play after a turnover by Qatar. And, um, you know, yeah, it was, that was huge. You know, that, that helped us finish second in the group. Yes, we had to play France, but, um, you know, I think it was better than – finishing third because I'm not sure if we would have even made it out of the group um, if we finished in third. So, um, you know, I guess Nigeria won too, or uh, sorry, Ukraine won too. So all that stuff aside, you know, it was, it was good to get the win um, in that, in that last game, even if we didn't play very well, but uh, you know, going into the Fran France game, I was very nervous, Pat. I wasn't sure what to expect, especially after that performance. Yeah, absolutely. So it was really great to see that incredible 3-2 uh, comeback victory, Austin, in the round of 16. Um, yeah, it, it was, was yeah. crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. That's, yeah, that's all you can really say. Um, I saw some of the social media reactions to some of the players um, you know, really hyped in the, in the stands. <laughs> I yeah. think it was actually uh, Durkin and maybe Mendez or some other players, but... <laughs> Well, yeah, because they were both, you know, right. out for this game now. Um, but that almost helped us, Pat. You know, we we played with a very, um, what's the best word to explain? We 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 brought in, you know, Richie Ledesma and yes. also uh, Brandon Cervania, two players who are very mobile. Uh, maybe that's the word I'm looking for, and players that were able to kind of, you know, run all all game long and really put France under pressure, and then you know in doing that we were able to capitalize on on uh, the mistakes that france made That's and right. um you know we we didn't have our best game and i understand that i you know france was one of the best teams at this tournament one of the most mature or senior teams at this tournament they had players who've played in you know the bundesliga Ligue um as yeah, a top caliber team <laughs> yeah it's a team that has a lot of professional minutes um and I think their value altogether was like 150 million or something, oh. which is just <laughs> insane compared to the U.S. <laughs> yeah, our value I think was somewhere in like the five to ten, maybe, maybe. And Tim Weah was six million of that. So, um, yeah, just just insane when you look at it on paper. But um, you know, I thought we played well against them, Pat. I know people were kind of disappointed with how we played against them, but. I don't think we were supposed to, you know, be the favorites in this game. And I, no. I think, you know, we came very far in this tournament as a team, but um, I, I was more. very impressed with their performance. Yeah. And it didn't seem like, you know, they sat back completely. They wanted to go out and play and, uh, you know, wanted to have the ball on attack. And that led to Cervania kind of really strong stop in defense. Austin Ledesma had that bursting run through the midfield. Oh yeah. Uh, to slot it into Soto with a, you know, cool, nice finish, uh, took his time to angle himself and, uh, you know, curved it around the goalie uh, to put us up. But I thought that was a really nice play. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the plays of the tournament for us, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Gloucester's Soto goal was very nice too. But that Ledesma run was was definitely, you know, that was a class run. Uh, That's right. And uh, unfortunately to that, you know, France had some uh, quick counterattacks too as well. I think they uh, ended up putting a two on us and made a two on in that second goal. I think it was Keita two maybe uh, that got yeah. burned. Uh, really bad. I mean, unbelievable. You know, again, like you said, France has all the talent. Um, 
and it was an unbelievable kind of you know bursting run. But uh, I thought uh, okay, it just didn't put himself in a great position or maybe a little too uh, you know just outclassed there. Uh, you could say in that play. Yeah, yeah, and I think Abubakar Keita kind of raised his level of play for this tournament. You know, I wasn't expecting much from him coming in just because I think he's played uh, college soccer and then, um, you know, is with the Columbus yeah. crew now, but is on loan at the USL. So I think, Yeah, I think he's in the third uh, division. The USL, was it the one now? Or the... Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah he's probably. The... Yeah. So that's, yeah, I didn't have high hopes coming in. And I think he, you know, he played up and, and played well at times, but you could definitely see he's not a high-level prospect coming out. As much as I, I wish he was, um, I'm not going to let a few plays that he had in this tournament really cloud my judgment. I I don't think he's ever going to be a you know a full U.S. men's national team player. Yeah, um, yeah, Austin. That, uh, I, again, I have to agree with you there um, from that point too. Um, and then uh, just at halftime too, I'm saying uh, some I thought some Tad made some really important subs here, uh, bringing on uh, uh, Yanez there and uh, Renix. Uh, came on right uh, in yeah. the second half. Uh, I the thought they were very half, instrumental. They mm-hmm. Yeah, they changed the game, or at least uh, Yanez did. He, right. Uh, he was a uh, added injection of pace in uh, in that final third. Yeah, it definitely seemed like uh, I think it was uh, Conor Del Fuente. Um, you know, the effort people said the finishing product wasn't there, but him and I think it was even Ledesma that came uh, came off just just looked a little gassed. Um, they really looked like they kind of ran out of uh, steam. Yeah, I think that's some of it. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how, how much truth there is to that of those players getting gassed. I, I kept seeing that on Twitter. Um, yeah. It is what it is. Like, these players have, you know, trained for two, three weeks leading up to the tournament. Um, I don't know. I think it's just an infusion of new ideas. Um, you know, players – Get tired over the game, sure. Are they gassed to the point where they can't pl- run or be dangerous anymore? No. I think they get, um, you know, just labored. And it's w- when you brought those two players on, it was just two players with, you know, um, you know, new ideas, um, you know, players who watched what was going on in the game and, and were able to kind of attack what we saw as some of the weaknesses of France where, you know, right. they like to play out of the back, but at the same time, like we were able to, to kind of, you know, pick off balls anytime the, the center back came up field or, you know, push them into um, situations where they were um, taking risks and we were able to capitalize on that a lot of times. So definitely. Um, yeah. And then, you know, Renick's got that nice goal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, I know <laughs> Dest had a, a rocket shot there. Um, you know, from far out. And yeah, like you said, Renick's kind of, um, you know, capitalized. had that capitalized game winner there uh, to put it up 3 2. And uh, before that, I believe Soto did score his second goal. So he did get braced there with a nice Tim, uh, Timo pass. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it was great to see, uh, like you said, kind of that injection of new ideas uh, from our substitutes. And then as well as just uh, um, the experience that Tim brings uh, to the team. Yeah, I thought Tim had a pretty good tournament. You know, um... He wasn't as flashy as maybe people were expecting, but, you know, dropping down a level and, and coming back to play at the U20 World Cup with more expectation than I think was just for him, um, at least from, from Europe. And, and he was a player that a lot of people from Europe knew, especially in this game against France. You know, he's playing yeah, with yeah. a lot of his former teammates. and <laughs> The PSG boys, the academy teammates. boys. Right. Yeah. So um, I thought, yeah, he played well this whole tournament. Um I couldn't have asked much more from him, to be honest. Obviously, it would have been nice to have him score more goals or provide more assists, but I thought he kind of, you know, came up um, in the moments where the U.S. needed him to, to you know, step up. And yeah, definitely. And he exciting. stepped up, certainly, and it was awesome to see us beat France. That was exciting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was, uh, it was a big win. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we moved on to the quarterfinal. We were all feeling good. You know, we were playing Ecuador, a team that I knew from just some of the previews I read and some of the, you know, the the scouting I've seen on them on Twitter and, um, you know, on, just online in general, that it was a very good team. You know, they were the con- condom ball uh, champions, Pat, of South America at the U20 level. So yeah. you knew that's going a, That's pretty impressive, Austin. Right. Yeah. So, you know, 
this was a team that we couldn't really take for granted. And I think, you know, coming into the game and, and when we started the game, I, I think we, we understood the team that we were up against. Um, but, you know, just unfortunately on the day, you know, Ecuador is just a little bit sharper than us. And, and it showed, you know, uh, you know, all day pretty much. It just seemed like we were, we were a step behind them. Um, you know, we did have a, some opportunities. Um, and, you know, we did score a nice goal with, uh, you know, Timo Wea off the yeah, – uh, Timo. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah, Ecuador took, took advantage of their opportunities. They were a team that, that just seemed to be a little bit more together than us. And, um, you know, it's fair. Uh, like I said, I think they, they're a team that, that can definitely – go to the final of this tournament and maybe even win the tournament. So yeah, definitely. Uh, awesome. It's any surprise that. Yeah. I was going to say too, it looked like um, the defending too um, was just a little, little slow and off place in, in terms of closing down. And they had some rockets and nice shots and things like that, but it, it just, it just looked like, uh, you know, overworked in the mid and they were, they were not closing down fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely were exposed in midfield and I think we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, in a second, but yeah, yeah, they definitely, you know, like you said, we're, um, you know, taking advantage of some of our weaknesses in this game. And, um, you know, I think they were des the deserved um, victors on the day. And, uh, you know, we were out. It wasn't of our day. It was not our day. Finals. It was not our day, unfortunately. So, so Pat, you know, after, you know, we saw this, this tournament and this run, it was, you know, a, a run that was full of up and downs. There was, you know, games where we played very well, um, and there was games where we played very bad. So with all that being said, Pat, kind of do you want to give me a few of the players you thought uh, impressed the most at this tournament? Who would right. those players be? <clears throat> Absolutely, Austin. I think right off the bat, you and I can both agree, uh, Chris Richards uh, was dominant. Yep. I think if you go to any coach, any analyst, things like that, any of uh, the YAH viewers as well, uh, you guys would all agree that uh, Chris Richards certainly had a fantastic tournament. And it was tough to see him, you know, at that one point get a little injury. But, again, fantastic player. He looks well above the uh, the U19 levels and ready to continue to progress, Austin. Yeah, yeah, I thought he uh, he showed well in, in, in all the games. You know, I think against Ecuador, he, he kind of met his match a little bit. I think, uh, you know, he played pretty well in that game. But that was a game where I thought he definitely was um, – kind of stressed or stretched at times and um, that game really made him work. But all the other games, you know, against Ukraine, Nigeria, you know, uh, Qatar, uh, France, I thought he, he looked better than um, the competition he went up against or, you know, just as good. Maybe France was the exception to that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, he, he was a player that looked very sound in possession, uh, good passer of the ball, made smart passes and was not afraid to, you know, uh, possessed the ball in, in tight situations and, you know, was, was strong in defense and, and could always put in a good tackle. So it's all, it's all you could ask for. And uh, really excited about him, Austin. But uh, I wanted to ask you, I guess, in terms of uh, d how did you think, uh, you know, another defender, uh, Chris Gloucester, uh, performed in this tournament? Yeah. So, you know, this tournament was pretty big for Chris because he's kind of on the fringe at Hanover at the moment. Um, it seems like Hanover hasn't been comfortable enough to really get them, you know, first team minutes and, and put their faith in them to the point where they actually, you know, play them or call them up into an 18, but he has impressed at the U23 level. So it, it just feels like Chris Gloucester was right on the edge of that Hanover first team and needed this tournament to really kind of give him that last, um, you know, boost or, or bump to get over that that hump that it seems like he's he's facing at the moment at Hanover, and I think you know he played very well uh, in this tournament. Pat, you know he 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 rose to all the challenges. Um, you know against France he was excellent. Um, you know he was able to get forward, but also you know read what other players were doing. You know coming down the wing on his side and was just smart to react and and always be kind of. Um, you know, kind of playing a step ahead, to be honest. Um, it, it seemed like, you know, he was never outdone mentally. It was always, you know, there were some players that, that maybe took advantage of, of his lack of speed. I don't think he is the fastest defender, but he definitely has enough speed to, to cover. And um, Right, he's not a Serginho desk going forward, but very strong defensively. 
No, but he – well, yeah, I don't – I I, I am not sure how fast Serginio Dest is, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, or maybe uh, not as, uh, you know, uh, open to going forward, I guess. He's not Anthony Robinson. Right, yeah, I guess that's a better a comparison. person who flies down the line and, and crosses it in. He likes to combine with players and get forward. But, um, yeah, I was, I was impressed with him defensively, I think. You know, if he stays on this course, I think he can get minutes at Hanover this year. And you never know. Maybe we, we call him up and we'll stream out <laughs> here. Yeah. Oof. Good good God. We need someone at left back. Please, someone step up. You got it, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that yeah, Chris Gloucester's performance in this tournament, very impressive, very bright. But uh Pat, what about another player like Sebastian Soto? How yeah. uh, how good was he in this tournament? I thought Sebastian Soto, uh, you know, performed brilliantly, Austin. Um, you know, with four goals, um, Brace coming to games, and especially, uh, like you said, against Nigeria, I think was one of his uh, his top games, definitely you could say, in the tournament. And he just looked, yeah. uh, you know, very solid, like I said before. Uh, his movement off the ball, just making those timely runs. Um, and just, you know, again, he's, he's kind of uh, – not that uh, super, I guess, technical forward per se, um, in my opinion at least, but very smart runs and able to finish. And he's just a poacher, and he and he looked, you know, really hungry at times, and you know, calling for the ball and combined really well with everyone. And I, I was very impressed overall, um, especially you know, again, going against a top team like France and uh, having the impact he did for that game. I was very impressive. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. All great points. I agree with. Um, and the thing you said about his his hunger or his determination—I'm not sure how you phrased it—but that was the thing that really stuck out to me. Um, it just shows that he's got that like pro mentality of like always wanting to be better, always like trying to to get the ball in that final third, always um, you know just talking to his teammates, never looking like he's um, like yeah. caught out of like position. Never seems right. like he's rattled. It always like the moment's like, not too big for him. Right, yeah. It always He's kind of like a leader in a sense, um, and that's what it looked like to me. So that was, you know, all the good things he did, all the goals he scored, that was impressive. But I was kind of more impressed with his mentality more, to be honest. Yeah, so. and that's a really good point you brought up just because that is something uh, from the top down that we're missing <laughs> national team players. Um, you can just see it just a little toothless, I think I mentioned a few episodes before uh, the attack and – uh, where's that hunger, that drive, that passion? And uh, like you said, uh, Soto is really seems like he's uh, edging and getting closer and closer to being a you know crucial player and and making that move to the the first team, you know, with uh, Hanover and hopefully uh, further along in his U.S. career um, because we just need that drive, like you said, and that that certain mentality. Uh, I think we're we've definitely been kind of lacking that. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see what he can do. You know, Josh Sargent's had his struggles breaking through at the uh, the first team level over in the Bundesliga. And, you know, Hanover will now be in the two Bundesliga this upcoming season. And hopefully Sebastian's still at Hanover. I think that's yeah. the best place for I, right I don't know about the Dortmund rumor. I, I'd be a little concerned. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the best option for him. I think he's just kind of got to stay, stay the course at Hanover, become a key player for them, and, um, you know, maybe in a year, year or two, if he gets some minutes under his belt, score some goals, he, uh, you know, he can move on to a bigger club, whether that's, that's Dortmund, right. um, Schalke, yeah. Frankfurt, maybe even Wolfsburg. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's what I think he's got to do. But, yeah, so Sebastian Soto, another big winner from uh, this U20 World Cup. And the final one, Pat, I want to mention is Richie Ledesma, who it seemed like Tab didn't trust kind of coming into the tournament or at least didn't um, – you know, he didn't play him in those first two games. He did come on against Qatar, and he looked good in that game. Then he started, you know, in place of Alex Mendez against France, and honestly was one of the the players of the game in that in in that game. Maybe you could give it to Sebastian Soto for his two goals, but right. Um, yeah, you know that run uh, and assist to Sebastian was, like I said, one of the best moments in this whole tournament for yeah. us. Awesome. That was another. That was another gear, um, and that's not an easy uh, midfield to get through. So it was exciting to see him because you know PSV does think so uh, highly of him um, that we've been kind of talking about in our show and you know seeing throughout uh, you know Twitter and social media and just to kind of see him on the the World Cup stage where he wasn't 
getting those uh, chances in the beginning, but finally getting the opportunities to you know get on the field and show what he can do. Like you said, he uh, and he can turn on another gear and make some uh, really really uh, nice runs and looks like he has that that extra gear that speed to you know go to the next level. Yeah, and he's got some great touch too. Um, yeah, very you know, clean. The ball sticks to his foot. It's <laughs> exciting. Got and, glue or something, Austin. Yeah, right. Some pine tar. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's one, and you know, this is just one thing out of you know all the minutes he played. But there is one takedown he had. I think in the Ecuador game when he came on, where it was you know a high, uh, I guess deflected ball up in the air or pass, whatever it was coming to him. It was a very high pass, whatever it was. And the ball just came right down, and he took it right on the ground in one touch. That was and so it was nice. It's like, yeah, it was just, whoa, okay, that's legit. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know, Richie really impressed me. I, you know, I thought he combined really well uh, going forward, and is a player that you know just likes to have the ball at his foot and create. So, you know, we always need more of them, Pat. Absolutely, Austin. Awesome. I think the the future is uh, looking bright for some of these prospects, and I know. Um, we had some players that uh, coming in, you know, uh, thought had some you know, good potential and some good, uh, you know, I guess hype you could say going forward, but had not the the best performances at the tournament. So, uh, any anyone you want to start off with, Austin? Yeah. So I think there's two in mind um, that we discussed. Excuse me, off camera, and the first one would be Chris Durkin. So, you know, Chris Durkin coming in, kind of like you said, Pat. We had. High expectations for him. You know, we, we've heard a lot about him, and we've even seen the quality he has. Um, you know, playing for DC United, you can definitely see some some bright aspects of his game. You know, his passing um, has been good in the past. It's been kind of his, uh, you know, his benchmark, the thing that he, he really prides himself on. And, you know, we did get, get some opportunities to see, you know, that long passing and what it can do and how it can open up teams and you know how how much of a playmaker he could be um i think in some of the earlier games we really saw that even against like ukraine um there were some great passes he played but as the tournament went on pat it just seemed like he was he was too slow to either you know get back and defend and he was also kind of too slow to react and 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 you know make a pass identify where the ball needs to go and it seemed like he he was losing possession um, too easily holding the ball too long, and that's slightly concerning. Yeah, definitely, Austin. Exactly what you say because I think uh, as well. I haven't been monitoring too much at DC, but I know um, some uh, return of some players. He, he's found playing time a little bit harder to come by. Um, right. I can double check that. I'm pretty sure that is the case. But I know, yeah, he he just looks like you said uh, all the things. I don't want to highlight too much and harp on it, but um, it looks like the moment really got to him and. Uh, he seemed kind of frustrated and frazzled. I know we were talking off camera with that yellow card. He just, uh, I know you, you can elaborate a little more, but he just looked, again, a little off pace and kind of thought maybe mentally something was going wrong and knew maybe, hey, like I'm having a really hard time against some of these, these uh, you know, players on my level. Yeah, yeah. You saw some frustration from him at times in this tournament, and that yellow card against Qatar was a good example of it. Um, you know, it was just a, a moment where he, like you said, got frustrated and, and lashed out, and he didn't need to. Um, you know, he wasn't playing the best even in that game and, you know, hurting his team even more by not being available for for us to, you know, pick him in the next game against France was, was kind of big. And, you know, looking back, it kind of helped us, to be honest. You know, Brandon Cervania coming in and being more of a box-to-box midfielder instead of Durkin where he's kind of that uh, deep-lying number six, um, that was almost the, I would almost say the, the play for, for the game against France and then also maybe even the game against Ecuador. Um, yeah, you could definitely argue that for sure. I, um, I think we might have fared a little better with Cervania on the field, which I definitely... Did not see hear that coming uh, or did not think that coming into the tournament, Austin. Absolutely not. <laughs> I was the first one in that game against Ukraine saying, what the heck, why are we starting <laughs> in Cervania? But... Um, yeah, so Durkin had a rough tournament. You know, obviously he's still a young player. I think he's only 19 at the moment. Um, but definitely not a good performance from him in any, really any of these games. Like I said, the Ukraine game, I thought he looked all right in. But um, the Ecuador game, he, he looked very bad. 
Um, mm. And it was just kind of a low point. Maybe it was just, you know, compounding of everything and um, him kind of losing his confidence as, as the tournament went on. And maybe it was just kind of, you know, a low point and not actually, you know, what we're expecting of him in the future. So, you know, we'll see what he can what he can bring in the minutes he gets for DC United. Um, there's talk about a move to Europe, you know, last year, I think, or the year before. I think that's kind of past, and I, I'm he may be a, an MLS lifer or even, you know, an MLS, yeah. uh, I don't know, player for the near future. <laughs> um, so, so we'll have to keep that, you know, monitor that situation and see if he can improve in the future because – we need some more of those, you know, defensive midfielders. Um, you know, Michael Bradley's not going to be around forever. That's so. right. And, uh, yeah, like you said, Michael, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, people have been a little critical of him, but honestly, compared to what we have, and hopefully uh, we can find a more of him going forward, uh, kind of played a crucial role. And uh, it just doesn't look like uh, – I mean, and, again, it's still early, but it just doesn't seem like Durkin is uh, going to take that uh, next step up. Yeah, which is disappointing because we saw, you know, James Sands at the U-17 World Cup and, and playing for NYCFC. He looks like a player that could be a good prospect at that same position. And it seemed like Durkin was the the star prospect of the U-17 World Cup or, you know, one of the star prospects. And now I would almost take James Sands um, in that position. So, you know, we'll see. Um, Pat, who is the other player that we thought – didn't play so well in this in this tournament. That's right, and that was the uh, the former um, you know young player, uh, you know men's young player there, um, Alex Mendez. Uh, That's so right. That, that was a little concerning, just because I know um, um, you know coming in uh, the the hype was really all around him, I'd say, and I know he kind of got off a little slow with with Freiburg's U19s, I guess, kind of just moving over there not so long ago, but didn't right. really see him too much in action, I think, Austin, but. Um, yeah, in this tournament, just uh, again, you you can't um, fault his his brilliant. Uh, I guess his was it his left foot there. Um, yeah, he has some, some crackers and some excellent shots and free kicks. But um, you know, it, honestly, I don't want to say this rough, but it was almost everything else that that just wasn't there. Yeah, and um, I think he's another player who started the tournament pretty well in that Ukraine game. Um, you know, he had some bright moments, like you said, the shots and the. Um, free kicks were good in that game. Some of his passing, um, even in the in the Nigeria game, he had some good passes. But you know, Qatari didn't play well that in that game. I don't think he played very well. And then in the game against Ecuador, he, I think he was. Uh, you know, if there is an efficiency coefficient in soccer like there is in basketball, I think it would have been in the negatives because he yeah. was not helping us on defense. And I, I don't yeah. think that was for a lack of trying. I just don't think he's strong enough or fast enough to defend. Yeah, because you can see it. Like the shots, like you said before, we were talking um, when we were covering it. Um, the shots, they had so much time to kind of line it up. And unfortunately, Mendez was a player kind of next to them, next to that right. Ecuador player. Yeah, for that first goal. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That was brutal. That was brutal. But uh, yeah, and then he just he gave the ball away too, too much in this tournament. Um, you know, Alex Mendez is supposed to be that that creative midfielder who you know has some moves in his arsenal to get by players and is a very skillful player. And like I said, we saw that at the beginning of the tournament, and we saw a lot of promise from him, but we did not see that in the final two games that he played in. And you know, he was a player that was turning the ball over, like I said, in the midfield, and also playing very poor passes from time to time. So. You know, for all the good things that he did, and I think I said this on Twitter too, he, he did like three to four bad things um, to counteract them. So, yeah, exactly like you said, like one or two steps forward and then a, a lot more steps back. So it was a little unfortunate to see him, uh, you know, at least, you know, end the tournament on kind of a really sour note. Right. And, you know, just like Durkin, he's a young player. I think he's still only 18. Um, and like you said, Pat, he just moved to Freiburg's U19s this past year. Um, in the winter. So, you know, I, I don't think he's going to play for their U19s this upcoming year. Um, I think he'll have to play for their two team. So maybe if he's playing against some some bigger players, he'll get more, you know, physically um, advanced or, you know, mature physically. But, but um, you know, I, I said this to you off camera, Pat, I think coming into this tournament, the expectation from me was that this tournament was going to help him get minutes in preseason for Freiburg. Um, for their first team, and I don't think this tournament did anything 
to that effect. And I think it's kind of showed us why he's, you know, not going to get minutes in the, in the near future for Freiburg. Um, you know, you got to defend in the Bundesliga. You got to be a player that um, is crisp with their touches, is crisp with their um, passing. Even if that's, you know, not making these creative passes, you got to just, you know, keep the ball. You can't lose possession. And it just seemed like Alex was not even up to that level, which is concerning to me. And maybe yeah, yeah. a few bad games, but you know it's it's on a big stage. So right, Austin. Yeah, like like you said, couldn't agree more. And um, you know, again, hope uh, Mendez can really uh, you know you know come back uh, stronger and you know really you know dig his head in preseason and have a good good year with Freiburg. But um, yeah, this this tournament definitely was uh, a little bit of a you know rough patch uh, for him at such a big spotlight um, where he you know really again like you said has those those nice little flashes of his technical ability. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, moving forward and being a first team player, um, you know, all that, um, I guess what do we call it? Like pizzazz or I can't think of the word right now. But all Maybe. that pizzazz or yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, is there, but you, you know, even just playing a certain role or, you know, playing a, you know, as basic as it is, if you're, you're just focusing your strengths and you know, not turning the ball over and just, Playing even the simple passes sometimes I think is really important. Um, and just kind of recognizing what moments you can pick and choose to do some of those things, um, and not you know turn the ball over all the time. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's how you know Christian Pulisic came through at Dortmund. He wasn't playing um, or even like trying to dribble through defenses. He was just playing you know the smart passes, um, getting into good positions, and capitalizing on you know the opportunities that came to him. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it was a step back from Alex in this tournament. Um, you know, he has a lot of quality. His left foot is better than most of the players in our pool, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. So he's just got to kind of hone those those weaknesses and, and work on some things this summer and, um, you know, maybe get some more game time under his belt, especially over in Europe. So, you know, we'll see. Um, you know, those were the players that kind of – that, that stood out and then also um, underwhelmed for us. And, you know, Pat, I think it's, you know, Tab Ramos has been rumored that he's moving on from the U20 cycle after this, um, you know, this U20 World Cup. So, you know, the past three cycles, we've reached the quarterfinals. And unfortunately, we, we still haven't gotten to a semifinal yet. So, so Pat, do you think it's a good thing that, that Tab sounds like he's moving on? Is it for the better? Yeah, you know, I would say... Um... You know, he has been such a staple in that in that program, and he does have. It looks like he has really good connections uh, with the players, and they really seem like they do want to play for him. So I guess that you know that man management, I guess you could say, or that individual style of that player. You're kind of a player's coach. Uh, he's been very good uh, for that uh, going forward. But yeah, like you said, I think uh, the times to kind of move on there, and um, you know, our, our pool. I think I believe uh, a lot of players are going overseas, and we're you know as the years go on, we're developing better and better players. And um, I think it's good for a, you know, a new coach to kind of come in with some new ideas and uh, fresh tactics and mix it up. And along with Tab, I think he's ready to kind of, uh, you know, move on to the next part of his career as well, Austin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think like all you, <clears throat> excuse me, all you said is, is accurate. You know, he has a good rapport with his players. Um, I think he's moved this program forward. But it just seems like now is kind of the time for him to, to move on. And um, it seems like he's accomplished, you know, all he can really accomplish with this team or, you know, these cycles. Right. Almost plateaued sort of in a way you could say. Yeah. I mean, that might be a little harsh. But at the same time, like this team was better on paper. And, and you could see in the games they were a better team. And I, I thought he kind of held them back at times, especially in that Qatar game, just – like the lineup he chose was just not right. And, you know, against Ukraine, not starting Sebastian Soto. Um, you know, maybe if we started Sebastian Soto, we didn't play France. And then subsequently we didn't play Ecuador. So, um, you know, it, it's all what if scenarios. But right. um, I think it might be better now to bring in some some new blood. Although, you know, at the <laughs> full national team level, uh doesn't seem to be working out so well. So. <laughs> well, uh, we'll, we'll keep uh, monitoring uh, that situation too. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was all in all, like I said at the beginning, I thought it was a pretty good World Cup, Pat, from us. Um, you know, we had high expectations going in. Um, I think our, our, you know, our floor of what we 
had to see from this team was reaching the quarterfinals. Um, and, and, you know, we saw that, and I thought they played pretty well in the quarterfinals. It just wasn't their day at the end of it. They couldn't capitalize on the opportunities that they created. So, you know, now we'll have to to watch the U-17 World Cup coming up in the fall and uh, kind of see if we're further along with that cycle than we were with this team, you know, two years ago. And um, Yeah, that's right, Allison. There's some exciting uh, young talent there as well. That's right. Yeah, that, that team's full of talent too. So, um, yeah, so that's all for our, our U-20, uh, you know, World Cup review. Um, you know, let us know in the comments what you thought of their performances, you know, let us know what players you thought stood out, what players, you know, didn't play too well. Um, I think we want to say Pax and Pomacall was, was Yeah, another good. shout out there. Pomacall was excellent, Austin. Definitely, definitely worth mentioning. Um, might be one of the players that we see with the, the full national team as well. And, um, you know, also Tim Way was pretty good too. So, um, so yeah, let us know in the comments below. And uh, now let's move over to our, I guess, our USMNT review of the two friendlies we had. And then also uh, we'll take a look at the Gold Cup. All right, guys. So we're going to take a look into those uh, awful uh, U.S. men's national team <laughs> friendlies, Austin, um, against uh, Jamaica, uh, which they, you know, unfortunately lost uh, in that brutal game. Uh, I think it was one nothing, right? And yeah, um, Venezuela, which was 3 nothing. So um, I guess we can kind of briefly, uh, I know um, it was a while back, try to block it out of our memory against Jamaica, Austin. Um, you know, came out the the start just looking, you know, horrendous and not making passes together and looked overrun in the midfield by uh, Jamaica's uh, USL team. Yeah, it was pretty much a team comprised of USL players and they just kind of ran circles around us on the day or at least forced us into giving them the ball right back. <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was pretty tough, Austin. It just, again, looked, um, and we can get into it more as we talk about Venezuela, but tactically... Uh, people weren't really an understanding of what was kind of going on there. And, um, uh, they, you know, Sargent, unfortunately, um, you know, for that game, was trying to be active, trying to get good runs in. But, again, nobody could really get him up there. Not many chances to take. Yeah, and I thought the, the balls that came to him, you know, he, he did a good job with, yeah. you know, did his best. And I thought he, you know, looked competent out there compared to times in the Venezuela game where Jossie Zardes kind of just looked – um, incompetent. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it was just disappointing. Um, you know, the goal that Jamaica scored was a nice goal, so take nothing away from them. Um, but, but, yeah, yeah. we yeah. really need to play better than we played in that game. Yeah, not so, honestly, uh, like I said, uh, not, not much to really, uh, you know, elaborate on besides uh, just overall poor performances. And um, we thought, Austin, that, uh, you know, after that, maybe that was just a little rust, you know, the group's kind of coming together and, uh, you know, with this next game, once we, you know, insert McKenney and, uh, you know, kind of see what else goes on here. And we have, uh, you know, Tyler oh, Boyd, yeah, Tyler Boyd, <laughs> the player we're excited about. So let's see what happens, you know, for the next friendly and, uh, uh boy, were we, uh, disappointed in that one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah that was, bad. that was brutal. Unfortunate, uh, three, nothing loss in the, you know, I, I have some uh, some notes here about the specific goals too, because uh, that Newcastle United defender run, or uh, attacker Rondon really, uh, you know, tore our defense up. <laughs> yeah, he had a field day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a field day. That's for sure. But um, yeah, I think it was in the 35th minute. It was a ball uh, over top uh, to Rondon, and it was just a long ball. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Aaron Long certainly had a tough time with him before, and uh, um, I think uh, just. Really, Rendon just muscled everyone off and, uh, you know, bossed around their defenders like uh, it was nothing. And um, you could see that with, uh, I think he scored two goals in that game. Um, and then, yeah, I think one of the other goals, too, I think it may have been the second of the game, came off of, uh, you know, shot the hit off the post and the defenders were slow to react and they tapped in. And this was all in the first half, Austin, so it was pretty ugly to watch. Yeah, it all happened, I think, in the first, like, 30, 35 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, the, the first goal was the one where Zach Steffen tried to play the ball out of the back. That's bat. right, yes. It's completely played it to Venezuela. And it was just, you know, we, we saw Zach Steffen have a few errors in the Jamaica game as well. And, you know, as much as I like Zach Steffen and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, um, like I'm still not comfortable with him playing the ball um, out of the back with his feet. Like everyone's right. saying, oh, you know, Ethan Horvath struggles to play with the ball at his feet, but 
I don't think Zach Steffen's much better. Um, you know, Zach <laughs> Steffen's a great reaction keeper or, you know, keeper with reflexes, but he's still got a lot of work to do with his feet. So he's, Yeah, it certainly does, Austin. And that um, is decision making. Like that wasn't even technique. That was just <laughs> not even seeing the field. Like Yeah, right into the middle of the pitch. It was really crowded right to begin with. And um, you know, that just got us all off on the wrong start and uh, kind of sent into mass panic there. Um, yeah. And and take nothing away from Venezuela too. Like they have players who play in in good leagues. Like you said, Solomon Rondon is you know a player who plays for Newcastle. Um, you know there was a few other players who I believe play in La Liga on this team. You know Yanhel Herrera who used yeah. to play for NYCFC. Yeah, he it's not a pushover team, Austin. Awesome. Yeah, and and they came out and showed that you know they're a team that wanted to punish us on the day, and yeah, we were punished before halftime. That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, that was yeah, definitely the first goal. And I meant yeah as well. The third goal um, was when Long, um, I believe, kind of uh, you know got bossed around there over the top, and uh, you know was too slow to react, and uh, got pushed off uh, one on one when he kind of recovered back, and uh, Renan just slotted that uh, for that third goal there. Um, but you know, all in all, Austin, that was definitely a you know performance to forget. And um, would you say kind of just tactically, like, or I guess in general, did do they really understand what's kind of going on or do, do you think, uh, I know there's still Berhalter needs a little more time, I think to you know implement the system, but we haven't really seen any improvement I'd say. Yeah. I mean, he started off pretty good. I mean, those first two games in January and, you know, we watched them together. We watched one of them together. Um, you know, that was, those were against teams that were C teams, B teams, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I don't count those March, we looked all right, um, you know, still not super convincing. And then now in these two games, it just looks, yeah, we looked horrible. Um, you know, like you said, not understanding the system. Um, you know, Burhalter made a change in that game against Jamaica, playing, I guess it was five at the back. And, yeah, I didn't think anyone really was looked comfortable in that system. It, it just seemed kind of disjointed. Um, and I feel like you could blame the system in that game, but in this most recent game, I just think it was certain players who are liabilities when they're on the field or just, you know, not up to the level of international play. And I think the first one is Will Trapp. Um, just a player who's not clean on the ball. Um, you no. know, he can make some nice long passes from time to time, but, you know, there were certain plays where he literally just had to pass the ball five feet to a player I think it was like to Tim Ream the one time and he literally passed it right to like the middle of his body and Tim Ream like couldn't do anything with the ball, but pop it up. And yeah. uh, it, I think it went out of play even. It was just like, dude, you got to be able to do that as a professional. It, like if you can't do that, you should not be on this team. Like yeah. you know, Tyler Adams, you could argue Michael Bradley. I, you know, he's better than Will Trapp in my opinion. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I, I feel yeah. like we could pick out another player or two that could, you know, consistently make simple passes and I feel like that's something Will Trapp couldn't even do in this game. Yeah, it's unbelievable, Austin. Just I get kind of the loyalty, I guess, and you've you've seen Burr Halter has seen him. Um and I can also miss his artist uh, in and out and um just in terms of trap like, oh, you know, just this national team level is just he's just not up to par. Um and we've seen it's now it's been a few games. It hasn't been just one or two. Now we've we've seen some glimpses and uh uh, again, those long balls are great, I guess. You know, they, that's the, the, the system. You know, play them out to the wings. Get those long balls over you know, to the wing players. But, man, besides that, he, he is just getting overrun by, like I said, and um, we are talking about the Jamaica midfielders in USL to Venezuela, who um, obviously I think is a little step up. But, I mean, it, he just does not look like uh, a national team player. And I think Greg needs to, you know, cut ties, I think. Yeah, but he was the captain in this game. So like, I yeah. I can't like that just gives me the worst um, possible feeling about Greg Berhalter. If this is the guy who's like the captain of his team and is supposed to be leading like the team on the field and you know being that person that everyone looks to to set the example, if Greg Berhalter is making this player that type of person on the field, um, like what are we doing? What is that like? Like, how is he evaluating a player's performance? Like, you can't tell me you're watching this game and say, you know, Will Trapp, for all the bad things he did in this game, I think he did, you know, 
positively infect, er, you know, impact us and, uh, you know, help us push up the field and, you know, try harder and, and do all the things a great captain does. Like, if he's not able to, to play well in the field, then all his credibility is gone. And Absolutely. then making that player the captain, all the credibility for Greg Berhalter, in my opinion, is gone. Uh, maybe I'm, like, way too early to say that. But, like, come on, man. Like, this is not the MLS. This is not Columbus Crew 2.0. This is <laughs> the U.S. Men's National Team where we're starting to get players, you know, albeit maybe three players at the moment, that can actually play at the, the at, you know, that high international level in the top leagues in, in Europe. Like, let's, you know, phase out some of these players who can't even, you know, fathom that level um, and get players who are, you know, at least like Dwayne Holmes is a perfect example. When Dwayne Holmes came into the game, he played so much better. Oh, he injected so much better. You could see it, Austin. And again, he didn't have an amazing game, but compared to everyone else, his touches were immaculate compared to, to Will Trapp. It was like night and day. I was like, what are we doing? I had no idea, Austin. I mean, it, it just seems like, and again, uh, we can get into this too, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, these friendlies and I guess your, your Gold Cup predictions. And is this a tournament where he's still going to kind of tinker? It seems like he's just been tinkering with the lineups. And again, these players are coming in trying to understand the tactics and, um, you know, having Trap and even having Zardis or are we going to see them, you know, starting these group stage games in the Gold Cup? And, uh, you know, if we move forward to the knockout stages against teams like Mexico and, and Costa Rica and, and even Trinidad, you could say, like, um, you know, as well as Jamaica. Um, are, is this what we're really going to play with? And if so, uh, I'm a little concerned that, uh, you know, about our, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, time going forward in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, it looks like we're going to play with, you know, Michael Bradley there if he's healthy at the sixth position. And, you know, we will slot in Christian Pulisic and Weston McKinney. You know, Weston played this last game, and I thought it was probably the best player on the field. You know, he didn't have his best game, but um, it seemed like he played harder than most of the players on the field. That's right. And he was more pushed up, right, Austin? So he, he couldn't – he wasn't like he was back, uh, you know, able to help, uh, you know, the defense as much, right? Right. And, and, you know, people are saying that that's probably not his best position, but I think, I think he's shown at Schalke that he can get forward and combine and, right. um, you know, obviously not finish in the box or be relied upon to finish in the box, but I think he can definitely play in those final balls into the final third. Um, yeah, there's just no one for him to play him to. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was no, nothing in this game. Like we had no rhythm at all. You know, no, we, we had troubles even holding the ball. Um, but yeah, and you know, adding Tyler Adams into the mix might help as well. But we're playing him out of position. Um, yeah, that that uh, that right back that goes forward, right? Yeah, and that's all well and great. Sure, like maybe the system long term will work. I don't know. Maybe I'm you know jumping ship too early. But like Tyler Adams, if you watched him this year in the Bundesliga, like we've done, Pat, um, you just see that he's a very very good player. Uh, potentially a world-class player, you know, I hate to use that word, um, but he's the type of player that you watched him play this year for, for Leipzig and you're like, wow, this guy can literally yeah. do it all. That's a top league on a very, very good, uh, you know, top German team, you could say, an elite one, definitely one of the top teams in the Bundesliga and inserted right in, looks so comfortable. Yeah, he played in their, in their um, DFB Cup final against Bayern and that was, you know, I guess two games back from injury, you know, he played or he started the game before the final Bundesliga game of the season and only played 60 minutes. And then they, you know, one week later relied upon him to start that game, you know, arguably the biggest game in their history. So just the fact that, you know, we're trying to play that type of player, that player that's, you know, challenging himself at the highest level has shown that he can be a difference maker on a very good team. And we're playing him out of position and into a position where, you know, if we're playing a good team and, you know, everyone's saying, well, maybe the formation will change if we play a good team. Um, this is just against the cupcake teams. Like, why are we trying to, you know, have him play half the time at one position and then half the time maybe at another position? And Yeah, know, Austin, I know me and you or you and I have the same kind of similar as um, I get the formation and what he's trying to do. But, you know, play. I think, and you said too, we have to play like Adams. We're giving an example play the best players, I think, in their positions. Um, yeah. You know, there's no reason to have him 
kind of just wait, um, we're just kind of wasting his potential back there. Right. Yeah, you're wasting, you know, a whole part of his game. He's he's very good, you know, getting forward and combining up the field. You know, obviously he's more of a six, and that's the position he plays at Leipzig where he can, you know, um, you know, destroy in the midfield and and uh, break up chances. But he's he's good at playing balls forward, and he's got such soft feet, and you know, he's just so good combining up the field that you're you're just hurting him, and you're you're, you're wasting his effect on the game, playing him in a defensive, you know, defense first position right back. So I don't know. I'm I'm just starting to get you know. Uh, right frustrated and concerned right and i'd say again we're not um again there's been i've seen some overreactions too i wouldn't say we're on that but we're definitely not in the right. light i think the spectrum is right in the middle just overall um and i think it will really um you know come to fruition or come to light with this tournament so um kind of more nervous honestly austin um than anything i'd love to see some surprises and like you said like Dwayne holmes and even boyd um you know good did okay like decent but again it's just you know, tough to get a good rhythm with you know any of these friendlies, but and maybe some bright spots. But man, I'm just really concerned um, because um, you know this is really giving a lot of these other Concacaf teams uh, um, that kind of I guess push or drive to really give us you know take the game to us now. Yeah, and Concacaf's to be honest has gotten better. You know, Canada's a, a decent team now. Um, Jamaica with Leon Bailey and all their USL players. Uh, you know. <laughs> Just beat up on us. So, um, yeah, it's a little concerning going into the Gold Cup, you know, not even scoring a goal. You know, we didn't even talk about that. We haven't even scored a goal in these tune-up matches. We've gotten destroyed 4-0, uh, you know, in, in two games combined. Right. And awesome. Yeah. Great point, too. I mean, look at our options here. I have it. We have Lewis, Morris. Uh, they have Boyd in that category. Altador, you know, come back. Zardis and Ariola. Those are kind of concerning in my, you know, overall top to bottom looking at that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah, I don't. And I don't think. Yeah. Any of them, maybe Altador, you could say, but you know, it is what it is with Altador. Um, right. He shows up sometimes. Other times he doesn't. Other times he has an attitude. Other times he's lazy. Um, it's just we'll see what kind of Josie we get, but um, I think yeah. it's just the depth, Austin, Austin, awesome, John. Just well, I guess want to hit on that final point, but just the depth. Um, I know it'll be great to see, you know, Pulisic and like I said, Adams and some of the other players now inserted into this lineup, but, um, you know, even Bradley, but it just, it just looks like the, you know, <laughs> our, our older players, you know, they're getting older and older and there's, we need some new, new life and new blood, I guess you could say into this team. And um, we've been trying, you know, for now, ever since that, uh, that awful, uh, you know, memory we want to forget in Trinidad, but we just need some, some consistency, some good play and some players to really step up and, I just hope we haven't, we haven't really seen that, I guess. Yeah, and, and I guess the thing I'm trying to say as well, Pat, and, and I, you just kind of made me think of this, and, and what I want to see from this team is I just want to see, you know, in my opinion, the three best players on this team, and maybe I'm a little partial to them because I follow the Bundesliga so, so uh, you know, so, so much, and that would be, you know, Christian Pulisic, Wes McKinney, and Tyler Adams. I just want to see those guys be the backbone of this team I want to see them be the ones that everyone kind of relies upon. And those, those in my mind have to be the players we put in the best position, you know, each game. Like those should be the guys that our team is built around. It shouldn't be, you know, we're trying to fit Tyler Adams into this hybrid position to kind of supplement Michael Bradley into the lineup when honestly right now Tyler Adams is a much better player than Michael Bradley. Um, I hate to, I hate to say it because, you know, People have started to love Michael Bradley again for some reason. <laughs> but we need to to take the three players, in my mind, that have elite, you know, ability. And I think they're all three are elite players or, you know, going to be elite players. We need to put them in the best positions possible and then kind of build a team around them to kind of supplement, um, you know, to, to, to kind of make up for the areas where they're going to get exposed. Um, and it just – Couldn't agree with you more. That. So – you know, I would love to see us play maybe like a 4-3-3 in an ideal world and be more of a, a high-pressing, you know, kind of win the ball back and, and hit teams on the counter at the moment just because I don't think we're going to be able to play possession with the players we have. Um, and I don't think we're good enough to play possession and score 
with possession, if that makes any sense. Right. And again, I completely agree. And I don't want to harp on this too much, but back to the MLS, I guess, you know, the crew can get away with it and you have more time and you have the players and, but this is a different level. And, um, you know, we just maybe don't have the personnel for this, this <laughs> formation. Maybe it's too early for the tactics. It might be, you know, you know, pushing too much on that, but I just, maybe we don't have the personnel. Yeah, maybe maybe we're not there yet, and you know I don't I don't think we are there yet, but I I definitely think we could be further along than we are. Um, so just concerns and you know our thoughts on the whole USMNT at the moment, the dumpster fire that is. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know looking ahead, the the US had their first game against Guyana on Tuesday, June eighteenth. So you know that should be a game where. We really should be able to to win. I don't think it's going to be an easy win anymore, but I think it's going to be a game where we have to come out and kind of you know assert w- how we're going to take this tournament on after the two crappy performances we've seen leading up to this Gold Cup. Um, you know, this has to be a statement game. I'm not expecting like a seven nil win or something, but I'm expecting like a comfortable two nil, three nil win where you know we look crisp and clean. And like I said, have our best players on the field. Um, you know, I don't want to see us resting Christian Pulisic just because he didn't get, you know, more than a week in training camp or Tyler Adams. Like, if we're serious about winning this tournament and getting the best players on the field in each game and, and um, you know, like I said, winning this tournament, we need to have our best players on the field in this game and set the tone for the rest of the tournament. Um, yeah, awesome. This is definitely, a, like you said, a statement game and, um, again, a, a little more uh, nervous, but also excited to kind of see what the adjustments are and who kind of maybe emerges from this this time because this again is a golden opportunity for some players or uh, you know some to kind of take the the realm from uh, you know the Bradleys and that kind of generation and say hey like we're gonna take this upon ourselves and you know rally the team together and and step up and make sure everyone you know has that passion and that that grit that we used to kind of see uh, you know back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope we can see that. I'm, uh, I want to be excited and happy about the USMNT. Something we haven't really felt for two plus years. So. <laughs> uh, we're dreamers. A, we're dreamers. On a down note, yeah, I guess we are dreamers. So, so yeah, you know, the Gold Cup, like I said, will start um, next Tuesday, and we're excited for it. So now let's, uh, you know, finish up our episode talking about two yas that we had, uh, you know do some good things this weekend or hear some good news about. So let's move on to that. So guys, to end our episode here, we just wanted to highlight uh, some Yaw players because uh, one of the seasons actually in uh, Denmark uh, finally ended and came to a close as we finished out uh, season two here, Austin. So so uh, we want to discuss Emmanuel Sabi and his heroics um, during the uh, Danish uh, relegation playoffs there. And he helped uh, Hobro IK, uh, you know, survive relegation and see another uh, season and uh, more days, uh, you know, in Denmark there. Yeah, and it was basically him on his own. Or, you know, he had an yeah. effect in pretty much all the goals that they scored over <laughs> the relegation fight. So Yeah, Austin, it was fantastic. Uh, just overall, he had three goals and an assist in the last three games. Um, you know, so that third game, I guess you could say, it was the, the second leg of the relegation playoffs and then the next round, uh, the final two games, he had such an impact. So just to kind of sum it up, um, you know, he actually had a, you know, we talked about actually in the last uh, episode way back when, uh, but he had that second goal in a 2-0 uh, win against Vibor in the first leg. Um, and it was, it was a great goal, kind of open there, unmarked, um, you know, header. But then the second uh, leg, he had a fantastic, and you've probably seen it, all you guys who are, <laughs> you know, focusing on the Yaz. Um Highlights on, on uh, I think it's uh, USMNT videos and all around Twitter and social media. He had a brilliant, awesome uh, individual run where he you know, sprinted through a few defenders, really bodied them off, pushed them off the ball, and uh, kind of stumbled where uh, one of the defenders tried to slide in uh, one of the Viborg cylinders to kind of cut him off and regain contr- uh, possession and somehow had the, the brilliance to to turn here, just kind of flipped the ball and turned it, um, you know, flicked it around the defender and cheekily put it past the goalie but it was you know brilliant strength and uh, awareness to you know, quickly be able to see that and capitalize and that kind of put the the leg out of question there and put him up three nothing um you know for the you know over the two course of two legs and uh, really guaranteed um that hobro would survive and again austin he is you know we talked about him all season but 
he had some goals. I think he had eight goals overall, but the final three just came in the most important games and moments for the team. So awesome to see. Yeah, you, you called him heroic, uh, or, you know, what he did heroic in the beginning. And, yeah, he was a hero for Hobro. Um, you know, he was he was the main man for, for why they're going to be playing in the, you know, the top flight there in Denmark next year. So, um, yeah. That's right. Tough. You know, hopefully he'll – well, I don't know if I should say hopefully, but it, we'll see if he's still with them next year. Maybe he moves up to a bigger club. But um, kind of like you said, you know, he, he started off the season well – had some some low points in, in the mid point of the season and then came alive at the end. So I, I don't feel like he's going to get a move, but, um, you know, we never know. But that's right. Know, has a, a good standing with the club now for sure. Going Absolutely. Into the yeah, couldn't be better off. And that would have been very concerning to drop to the, the second division there as we, you know, and a lot of people probably would have, you know, not recognized as much as his performances for the following year. So really crucial for him and even Christian Cathys, who uh, is on the team as well and substitute in the final leg, um, I think in like the 50 uh, something minute um, to be able to stay in the first division here. And um, maybe, yeah, like you said, maybe Sabi doesn't get that move initially, but at least now he's kind of, you know, the eyes are on him. Um, you know, definitely some scouts, uh, you know, in the league and abroad are, you know, definitely watching that and saying, you know, wow, that was really, you know, some clutch performances for the final three games. It's not like it was just like one little moment. He was he was playing very well in those games as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you never know when scouts are watching. And, that's uh, right. Yeah, that's probably – those games were probably where the scouts were watching. So yeah, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, Austin, I mean, you know, all the best. Uh, I'm glad we were able to, you know, finish out, uh, you know, one of our players here abroad on a high note and, uh, you know, avoid relegation. But I know you have some exciting news uh, for one of our uh, goalkeepers. That's right. And one of the new players we're going to be covering next year um, as he makes his, his move to Man City. And what we heard this past week, potentially uh, Fortuna Dusseldorf in the Bundesliga, and that would be Zach Steffen. So, um, you know, this move sounds like it's pretty close to being done. Um, and it'll be a loan move, obviously, from Man City. But, um, you know, Pat, I think it's a good move for him. You know, Dusseldorf is a team that's you know, was just promoted to the Bundesliga last year. They finished, I believe, in 11th, 11th or 12th, I want to say, um, this year in the Bundesliga. And they were a team that was, you know, very inconsistent, but they were a team that, you know, could beat the big teams and, um, you know, were an exciting team and played an exciting brand of, uh, of football. So, you know, uh, it was another team that that doesn't have really a goalkeeper going into next season. They have, I believe, a 35-year-old uh, Michael Rensing, who was the starter for them this past season. Did okay. Um, was a, kind of a middle-of-the-pack goalkeeper in the Bundesliga. So it looks like Zach Steffen could be the man going into um, preseason. But, uh, you know, he's got to show it now. Um, you know, moving from the Columbus crew over – and I should say back to, to Germany since he was there with Freiburg for a period of time, um, it's going to be a, you know, a big challenge again. Um, it sounded like he didn't really take to life in Germany the first time around. It seemed like the, the plan that Freiburg had for him was not a great plan, and it didn't seem like he was really going to break into the first team uh, there anytime soon. So you know he jumped ship, came back to America, and um, now finds himself back in Germany again. So... You know, he's got to get off to a good start. We can't really see yeah. that performance from Venezuela being, uh, you know, that first impression over there I in Germany. That's completely agree, Austin. And I want to mention, too, he had a nervy moment almost similar to that uh, against Jamaica. Um, but as well, you know, the nervy moment in Venezuela, um, that didn't certainly help. But again, um, like we said, he's amazing. Some of the strengths that he showcases and that we've seen with the national team as well as, uh, you know, for a club and the crew, um, hopefully, you know, his time with the crew has kind of built back his confidence, which he kind of lost over at Germany. Um, and hopefully, yeah, like you said, hopefully he can, you know, get into that, you know, starting lineup there and make an impact because if he's not starting, then, um, that job for the U S is number one could go, you know, just kind of like that away. And there's a lot of other, you know, players like Horvath and some other keepers that are vying for that spot as well. And, um, I'd love to see Stefan perform very well for Dusseldorf if the rumor uh, there is, you know, officially confirmed and, uh, you know, going over to the Bundesliga, I think that could be a, you know, a really good move as well. Um, but I guess I was kind of curious too, um, just thinking in terms of the transfer to Man City, it seems like, um, and, I, and I, we've seen it now with a few other American players at some big clubs, they go to these big clubs and they kind of get loaned out to, uh, 
you know, some teams that are just kind of the, the life of the lonely. I'm, I'm curious, I guess, in general, if you, if you think, um, again, we're talking about Dusseldorf, but do you think this Man City move was right for Stefan or should he have kind of, maybe, I don't, I didn't know what the other specific offers were, but it just kind of seems like it'll be really hard to break into that first team. Yeah. I mean, I don't see him ever really playing for Man City. Um, you know, maybe if he can string performances together, you know, improve, you know, playing with the ball at his feet, um, you know, just become more of a consistent keeper. Maybe one day he can make, you know, that Man City first team if something happens where, you know, they can't go out and purchase, you know, a world-class keeper. Um, but I don't really see Stefan ever becoming a world-class keeper. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, can he, you know, use those loans uh, to kind of generate a move that, you know, is to a club where it's a, you know, in that tier just below Man City? Maybe, um, you know, if he plays in the Bundesliga this year, really turns it on, shows, you know, that he's one of the the best reaction uh, keepers, or you know, just shows that it, just in general, even if he can put together a complete season and show that he's a top eight Bundesliga keeper, then, you know, maybe he gets loaned to a, you know, a better team next year in the Bundesliga and, you know, maybe that team buys him. Um, so we'll see, you know, there's a lot of paths he can, he can go, I guess Man City gives him some good exposure. Um, and, you know, the other moves we heard that he was linked to was like Bristol city in the championship. Um, you know, some teams like that where, yeah, maybe not the best. Yeah, not the best. Um, so, you know, maybe this was the best option he had and the loans, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what he can make of it. You know, I think the loans give him an opportunity. Now it's up to him to really take that opportunity and show that he deserves to be, you know, at a better club than maybe some of these teams he goes on loan to. That's right. It'll be that's interesting all you need. To, yeah, that's all you, you need. need the opportunity. So. I'm excited to talk about him now, Austin, for the future here. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I think we have maybe one year left. I think he's like 24, 25 now. So, um you know, we'll see. We'll see what he can do next year. Um, you know, I'm excited. And as always, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video and subscribe down below. And also, don't forget to check out our social media. We have our Instagram and Twitter always putting out that great content for you guys. We had this jersey giveaway, you know, keep going. So we've been posting about that as well as I've uh, been keeping up a lot in the U20s, Austin. That's right. And, you know, uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've been very active on Instagram, so definitely give that a follow. Um, you know, we just had a jersey giveaway as well. So, uh, yeah, we're, uh, you know, trying to reach out to you guys a little bit more. And, uh, you know, we always love to interact with you guys. So and That's right, Austin. And I know, um, you know, even with uh, some of this, this sour taste in our mouths from the friendlies here um, and some good moments and some lows with the U20s, uh, we're all working towards a top common goal here. That'll hopefully happen. Yeah, well, I'm going to say this, that uh, performance against Venezuela made me a little bit more pessimistic here in the, uh, in the ending. So I think one day, maybe we will win the World Cup.